Well, you could pass them out really probably at the beginning. Uh, one of them is uh, just essentially how I've divided this paper. And uh, it's pretty long, so I probably won't uh, I'll probably summarize some sections of it. The other one is a fact sheet uh, which has uh, uh, tables on, uh, first of all, the UN's breakdown of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the effects of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, and then also a listing of uh, the major chemical and biological uh, agents, ones of concern. And then uh, I also have uh, taken the liberty of my uh, friend uh, at the uh, Stimson, Henry L. Stimson Center uh, in uh, Washington and distributed and had reproduced actually her listing of the uh, agents, precursors, etc., that uh, are uh, on the Australia Group's list of uh, uh, agents that could potentially be dangerous dual purpose agents. But I'm going to talk to a great extent in somewhat philosophical and extended terms. Today, uh, actually, I've titled my piece, Weapons of Mass Destruction and Mov Movement Towards the End of War, question mark. And the term end is used in several ways throughout this uh, presentation. I love to play with words because uh, part of my education was actually in English and comparative literature. My MA was. And I wrote my MA thesis on Marcel Proust. Uh, I've come a long distance uh, from that, uh, I may add, in recent years. But I use the word end in various ways, uh, termination or elimination, aim, and uh, result, you might bear that in mind. Yes? Uh, the, uh, I didn't explain the format of how you wanted to, to work the session. I oh, okay. If you would explain that, and then yeah. at, at your, uh, we can take a break whenever you decide. Okay, well, I will, uh, the, the format that uh, I proposed uh, uh, to Colonel Davis is that I give my presentation uh, if you have questions, if you would write them down, and then we'll have a session. Uh, it will be a free for all. I had originally uh, was going to do it in a different manner, but I ended up <laughs> writing a formal paper. That's an academic disease, I may add. Our century has been haunted, first of all, in the nature of war. Our century has been haunted by apocalyptic visions, our past century. Upon viewing the atomic test in Alamogordo, New Mexico, on 16 July 1945, Robert J. Oppenheimer recalled the words of Vishnu to the prince in the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. As he speculated, I suppose we all thought that one way or another. The subsequent use of atomic weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the culmination of a war that had been fought with a ferocity unmatched in history. Not surprisingly, therefore, many prophets predicted that the next war would be nuclear and that given the development of even more ferocious hydrogen, bomb, hydrogen weapons in the 1950s, it could well lead to the total destruction of civilization. We are faced here with a paradox. Throughout history, an increase in force for one side has allowed a given belligerent an increased advantage over his opponent. Now the major nuclear powers have reached the point where they command far too much force for the sane achievement of any uh, com comprehensible political purpose. Not surprisingly, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many voices were raised asserting an either-or proposition. Either we end war, or it will end us. But wars have continued to be waged, more than a hundred since 1945, and political leaders have continued to use war in the pursuit of national interests. So what is war? Is it an apocalyptic confrontation, an explosion of force without restraint or limit? Or is it a tool of state policy designed to achieve certain specific ends? Or is it both? 
uh, Clausewitz, and I did bring a copy, I may add, with me, don't leave home without it, or without him. Uh, Clausewitz explored the contradictions of war theory in a series of famous definitions. Defining absolute war, the Prussian military theorists argued that, quote, to introduce the principle of moderation into the theory of war itself would always lead to logical absurdity. End of quote. And then another quote, war was an act of force, and there is no logical limit to the application of that force. But then, further on, he goes on to say, but war is also a true political instrument, a continuation of political intercourse by other means. The development of weapons of mass destruction, I'm, by the way, in this presentation, assuming that you know all the acronyms, so I'm not going to define them, uh, the development of weapons of mass destruction, unforeseen by Clausewitz, and not feasible until the 20th century, threatens to undermine the policy of restraint and control implicit in his second definition, pushing the use of force towards the absolute release of violence. A war that begins with well-defined and limited goals may end up in a conflagration that destroys civilization. We have, therefore, two basic images of war coming from that. One projects it as a rational, controlled use of force serving the achievement of national ends. The other as a spasm release of uncontrollable force serving no end except annihilation, what Herman Kahn calls spasm war. Doomsday, however, has not come. Instead, the post-World War II conflicts have been fought without the use of nuclear weapons. Political objectives, therefore, can limit or control the use of force. Although every law of restraint has been broken in the history of warfare, the use of absolute force, even when available, has not yet occurred. Now, another of Clausewitz's key concepts is friction, which breaks the momentum of military operations and limits the extremes to which violence can be taken by either side. As he emphasizes, action in war is like movement in a resistant element, will against will. And there are several kinds of friction, one which arises out of the determination of the opponents to force one another down. Now, Clausewitz compares uh, war to a wrestling match. Each side exerts maximum force to compel the opponent, his opponent to do his will, or to put it another way, to overcome the friction that comes from his opponent's will. Second, there is the friction created by space and time, geographical obstacles, distance, terrain, the time it takes to mobilize, organize, and train forces, which when prepared often have miles to cover before they reach their objectives. Third chance, uh, which often plays God, plays God in war. And anybody who's studied war knows uh, about chance. But the development of weapons of mass destruction with a spectacular increase in range, firepower, and speed has wrought a revolution in warfare, diminishing the role of friction. Of course, it would still play a role, even in total war, in which weapons of mass destruction were used without restraint. Weapons would still fail to function. Commanders would still go astray. Orders would still be misinterpreted. Chance would still play its classic role. But what we can say is that the barriers of space and time have shrunk to such an extent that they have become almost insignificant. Now, Clausewitz finally, and I'll come back to him later, judged that the defense was naturally stronger than uh, offense. It used to be true that for every weapon there was a counter weapon. The sword and the shield would ultimately balance out. And in World War I, offensive chemical warfare uh, was soon countered by defensive measures. Uh, cloud attacks, the artillery barrages, of course, were countered by gas masks. Even today, when far more lethal chemical weapons are available, there are limitations which bear upon the use of these weapons. 
The same is true to a lesser extent of biological uh, weapons. But limitations almost totally vanish when it comes to nuclear weapons against which no effective current defense exists. We have reached at least the threshold of absolute war. Well, turning on to weapons of mass destruction, in the uh, first uh, nuclear, in the thermonuclear age, of course, restraint has become uh, imperative. The Roman pilum could strike down only the opposing soldiers in the front line of the enemy battle formation. Today, long-range missiles can breach intercontinental barriers. And uh, as we're all aware, a submarine launched nuclear weapon fired uh, from the Western Atlantic could reach Washington in very little time, probably less than 20 minutes. The battlefield of any future world war could cover the entire globe. So that the frictions uh, that Clausewitz talks about, which limited the, for the force of any attack, uh, the obstacles presented by nature and by an opponent's counterforce could be overcome by an attacker's first strike. Now, the magnitude of potential destruction in future war uh, has been magnified not only by the yield of modern weapons, but also uh, by the culmination and the development of their means of delivery. Uh, and you can look at, at this as a long-range historical development. Uh, you begun with artillery. Uh, then you went, of course, to long-range bombers, then finally to the emergence of the intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, the increasing range of weapons distancing the launcher from his target and giving an advantage uh, to the offensive. Provided the initial blow is massive enough, the initiator can now overcome traditional barriers, uh, denying the defender the interval or the protective space of time and space uh, to recover and to strike back. Think of what that has done to the whole concept of mobilizing forces. That, you know, we're so, uh, we, had, we had those barriers in World War II, and, and it gave us the time, really, although we were horribly unprepared at the beginning of World War II uh, at the, in Europe uh, uh, to uh, uh, get ready for combat. In the 20th century, therefore, we moved from the limited wars of the 19th century uh, to uh, total war. And now we have the potential for absolute war. So in recognition of this mounting danger, the United Nations in 1947 defined weapons of mass destruction as including nuclear, chemical, and bacteriological weapons, or biological weapons is more accurate today. Toxins are usually subsumed under biological or chemical weapons, although my German colleague in our, our joint production, Professor Erhard Geisler of the Max Delbruck Institute, has argued strongly that they should be treated as separate uh, weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction. Uh, but uh, I will not uh, go on, as I have in the text, on uh, uh, defining these uh, too closely, because I am assuming uh, that you are well versed now in the difference between uh, uh, the ranges, etc., uh, and the explosive force of uh, nuclear and uh, thermonuclear uh, weapons. Uh, what that development did, of course, it, it evoked the whole question of the advantage of striking the first blow. Uh, that obviously, if you struck the first blow, uh, that uh, provided uh, an, uh, an advantage of, uh, as long as it was uh, uh, thorough and uh, complete enough and uh, certainly a temptation to any aggressor. Uh, in the United States, as you may know, uh, President uh, Dwight Eisenhower ruled out the idea of uh, preventive war as being against uh, our values and indeed our cultures, being ethically, uh, shall we say, unacceptable. The Soviet Union flirted a great deal with the idea of what they called a preemptive strike. Uh, and that uh, being, of course, when they thought that the, we were about to strike them, they would strike first. Uh, th that uh, poses, uh, quite, uh, as, as you can well imagine, uh, a, uh, a difficult problem when you determine that the opponent is going to strike. 
uh, when you think of, for example, the problems of, uh, that led to Pearl Harbor, the intelligence uh, problems. We knew the Japanese were going to attack. We just didn't know that they were going to uh, attack uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, but uh, all of this led, of course, to a, a great deal of attention on second strike cap capability and finding ways of controlled use of uh, nuclear force uh, in limited wars. Increasingly, however, the conviction grew that uh, the function of nuclear weapons was deterrence uh, rather than war waging. Now, the other weapons of mass destruction, uh, again, I won't go on as I do in the paper uh, to defining uh, them because I think you know that uh, pretty well. There's several uh, categories of it. You can find it uh, in our book. And... Um, uh, in any case, um, in the first table that you have here in its 1969 report, the United Nations drew up a comparative table estimating the disabling effects of hypothetical attacks on totally unprotected populations using a nuclear chemical or bacteriological biological weapon that could be carried by a single uh, strategic bomber. That's the first table, and as you can see, the potential range of a 10-ton biological attack significantly exceeds even that of a one megaton uh, nuclear explosion. Chemical weapons, of course, have a more limited range, but 15 tons of nerve gas can cause 50% uh, death rate in the affected area. I must caution you, however, that the table deals only with an unprotected population and that there are many variables uh, which would affect the impact of any attack. Uh, as military men, you're very familiar, of course, that uh, almost any military plan begins by naming all the assumptions uh, that uh, govern the thinking that uh, follows, as indeed it, it should. You just hope the assumptions are correct if you're going to act on it. Uh, but uh, things that would modify it are obviously put, uh, protection, the degree of protection, weather, climate, physical structures within a target area. And the speed of the effect of any chemical agent depends upon which agent is used. Nerve gas, for example, is far swifter than mustard gas in producing uh, effects. Uh, now, again, uh, and uh, I'll go f through this, uh, I'll, I'll leave the reading uh, for you and uh, not to go into the details as to what chemical and biological weapons uh, do. Uh, I think um, most of that you probably know uh, anyways. Uh, I will say, however, that one of the limitations of chemical weapons is that, as you can see, far larger quantities have to be used to produce the same number of casualties as are produced uh, by the use of nuclear or biological uh, weapons. The advantages of those two weapons, and you find this, by the way, we are working, by the way, or we're proposing to do uh, a second uh, study of the history of biological weapons. It will not be published by CIPRI, uh, however, and uh, after having been editor of one volume, I'm letting somebody else uh, do that, uh, that task. Uh, since 45 and up to the time of uh, that uh, we gave up, or the United States at least gave up its uh, biological uh, weapons uh, uh, program. But if you look at the, the papers in the archives uh, post-1945, you find one of the strongest arguments uh, for developing uh, chemical or biological weapons is that they re leave the real estate alone. They kill the people. Uh, but you inherit the real estate, so you don't have to go for urban redevelopment uh, after you used uh, uh, these, um, uh, these weapons. Now, I will go on to the question of what do they share with nuclear weapons? In what ways are they weapons of mass destruction? Because I get arguments on that constantly. Well, they do share a good number of characteristics. First of all, they are indiscriminate. And secondly, they are basically uncontrollable. Uh, third, they are poisonous. In World War I, chemical warfare was basically a conflict between soldiers, almost totally, in fact. Civilians were not targeted. 
Yet civilian casualties occurred behind the Allied lines in Flanders and France. These casualties were as inevitable as the killing of civilians in medieval siege warfare. Then the lethality of chemical warfare agents was limited. Nerve gases revolutionized that. And it could be countered by the adoption of defensive measures and equipment. The development of nerve gases has turned chemical weapons into agents of mass destruction. And it has obliterated, I think, the argument used formerly by the advocates uh, that gas was a humane uh, weapon. Moreover, the development of strategic bombing in World War II opened up the prospect of targeting large population centers with chemical bombs as well as conventional munitions. The Allies drew up plans for CW attacks against all major German and Japanese cities in case the Axis initiated gas warfare. You have some of those plans, by the way, uh, in your historical office uh, over here. I've seen them there. In World War II, however, except for the Japanese use of chemical weapons against the Chinese and also some biologicals, deterrence has held since the other major belligerents refrain from using chemical or biological uh, warfare. There were some accidents, uh, as, uh, as we know. Well, biological and toxin warfare, of course, is by nature indiscriminate. Targeting soldiers in a battlefield carries no guarantee that these agents will not travel into population centers far behind the battle line. The use of infectious agents like smallpox could create an epidemic with disastrous consequences, especially since the elimination of this disease has paradoxically left nations highly vulnerable. Another example, anthrax spores are long-lasting, and the pulmonary form uh, of the disease, if untreated, is highly lethal. The use of anthrax could leave cities uninhabitable for decades. During World War II, the British used Grenard Island off the coast of Scotland as a testing ground. It was only in this decade, almost 50 years later, uh, that the island was finally declared free of anthrax spores and safe to reoccupy and return to the original owners. I wonder with what feelings they took it over. In a BW attack, the use of either anthrax or smallpox could trigger a massive panic among the civilian population. That's one of the things we worry about, uh, of course, in our colloquium, overcoming the medical safety net. Second, chemical and biological weapons, like nuclear weapons, are basically uncontrollable. Chemical weapons can be safely used by a combatant if they are fired at targets beyond the battlefield, airfields, supply depots, lines of communication, ports and cities, objectives which could be targeted. When used on the battlefield, of course, they can boomerang. There are countless cases in World War I of gas being released and then blowing back uh, upon uh, those, uh, the initiator. And uh, unless uh, the attacker is well prepared defensively, he can suffer severe uh, casualties. Biological weapons are even more uncontrollable. Uh, if you're going to use them safely on the battlefield, you have to inoculate your troops. Of course, the fortunate thing about that is that that might uh, if you inoculate your troops and you start carrying out exercises, tell them how to use these things, uh, which are difficult to control, you may provide in the intelligence that the uh, uh, victim state uh, needs. Although that's always difficult, indeed, and particularly with biological weapons. Now, despite a long-standing taboo, and I move now to war between nations, Chemical weapons, and to a much more limited extent, biological weapons, have been used in warfare. And chemical and uh, biological terrorism is currently viewed as a major potential threat. What are the chances that they will be used either in war or as an instrument of terror? Who are the most likely initiators? How can we guard ourselves against it? Well, I'll begin uh, by... Uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the possible use uh, between uh, nations. Uh, then I'll go on and talk about uh, 
uh, norms, ethical norms, arms control, uh, etc. Yes. I want to make sure, uh, make sure you understand. This document that he passed out here is the outline in which you speak from. Just want to make yeah. sure. You, okay. Good. In the post Cold War world, the problems posed uh, by weapons of mass destruction is far more complicated, I may add, than in the days dominated by the confrontation between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. The danger of wishing, as so many of us did, for the dissolution of the U.S.S.R. as a, a major power is that you, you, know, you sometimes get what you wish and then you've got a worse problem than you had uh, before. Uh, because now we have the problem of proliferation uh, and uh, the picture of who is the enemy is not as clear as uh, it, it was. And not only that, the borders of the Soviet Union are porous and we worry about this uh, stuff getting into the hands of uh, uh, agents who cannot be uh, controlled. Well, if we d deal with those questions, I have uh, a number of possible scenarios to skip uh, over. I will say that in my belief, uh, it is my belief that major powers war scenario, in other words, the use of uh, CBW uh, between the major powers uh, is uh, rather unlikely. Uh, both uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, who had extensive programs, especially the United States after 1945, have now renounced uh, those uh, both biological and chemical weapons in a uh, series of, uh, of treaties. Uh, however, of course, there are still implementation problems, and some of them quite serious. Uh, there's the problem of uh, that we've discovered with the Russians uh, on the BW front uh, uh, when uh, uh, it was uh, very clear from uh, defectors uh, that uh, they did not adhere to the uh, 72 uh, prohibition, and 72 treaty, uh, and uh, even though they are dismantling certainly the facilities that Biopreparat uh, control, the so-called civilian agency, uh, our boys haven't been able to get into uh, either the, uh, any of the military facilities, including Sverdlovsk, where the famous accident uh, happened in 79 with the release uh, of uh, anthrax. Most people I consulted, I, I'm, uh, I'm doing a, um, uh, a paper which uh, I sent the first draft of uh, uh, for uh, Minerva on, uh, on this issue, partly the Russian and the U.S. program and what made the two scientists in the two nations go ahead uh, on it. Uh, and most of the, I, I consulted a lot of experts, uh, are the Russians still cheating? And uh, the consensus was no. I mean, some of them did think yes, but most uh, of the experts thought no. And these are fairly hard-nosed uh, uh, people, but nonetheless, of course, uh, the trust has been breached, and that creates uh, uh, a, uh, a problem. Uh, the use uh, by a rogue nation against a major power, well, we all know who the usual suspects are. Now, to use the phrase from Casablanca, North Korea, Iraq, Iran, Libya, the Sudan, uh, and, uh, and Syria. Uh, the popular view is that these are run by terrorist uh, madmen. Uh, and, uh, however, uh, I would qualify that. They're madmen in our view because they certainly don't uh, share our values, uh, and uh, they're autocratic and secretive uh, regimes, but their rulers are practice survivors. Uh, and you will remember, of course, that uh, Jim Baker was, uh, did convey an ambiguous but convincing message to Saddam Hussein as to uh, uh, what to expect if the Iraqis used uh, chemical or biological weapons on the battlefield. Uh, Hussein was left, in other words, on the edge of uncertainty. And I cannot believe that uh, all of these rulers, including uh, uh, Gaddafi, one of my least favorite characters, uh, would use these weapons unless possibly they were pressed against the wall. And we might think of the effect that the, uh, really the development of these weapons or the possession of these weapons has had on the idea of unconditional surrender, which we had the freedom, of course, to use in World War II. 
I think the most uh, likely case is the use of, by possessor states against non-possessors. That's the pattern that history uh, shows us. The Japanese against the Chinese, the Italians uh, in Ethiopia, uh, the Egyptians in the uh, Yemeni uh, civil war, and the most intensive use, of course, the, uh, that took place in the Iran-Iraq war of 1980 uh, through uh, 1988. Now, if you look at terrorism, let me move uh, from that, uh, there are three candidates that are usually cited as potential uh, 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 NBC terrorists. With my apologies to the uh, broadcasting uh, system, but that's the acronym. Uh, from uh, the rogue states, terrorist groups with a political agenda, and fanatical sects. From whence comes the greater da greatest danger? In my opinion, it comes from the last group, the fanatical sects, whether homegrown or foreign. And uh, in the in the paper, by the way, I'll be glad to share this uh, with you afterwards, as long as uh, you use it discreetly within your own circles, because it, it is unpublished. Uh, because there's a great deal of material I'm not going to be uh, able to go through unless uh, we, do, we had to rule out the discussion, and I wouldn't want to do that by any manner of means. Uh, again, uh, with rogue states, I think that that is unlikely that, that they would resort to terrorism. Uh, the problem, of course, that there's a great intelligence problem, as, as our book uh, points out. And, and I even went so far as to say we have an in, uh, in World War II we had an intelligence black hole as far as the what was going on in Japan and Germany and uh, some have objected to that and some intelligence people have said oh but that no longer exists a and uh, I've, um, I've I've tried to be polite but I'm skeptical uh, <laughs> that uh, you know our intelligence can really spot uh, uh, what is going on uh, uh, in that field uh, so there is an intelligence problem of course if a rogue state uses an agents uh, but I still think that uh, they are the most unlikely to do it because uh, our detection uh, methods in the long run could probably uh, trace uh, back the source of origin. I think, of, of course, the blowing up of the Pan Am uh, airliner, which was certainly a very difficult um, uh, detection job. Anyways, they wouldn't know whether we could or not. They would be taking a chance. Non-state actors with a political agenda. Uh, of course, you think of the IRA. Uh, hopefully we don't have to think of that too much longer. Uh, Jihad, uh, uh, bin Laden, well they have uh, limited political objectives. Uh, uh, the Islamic ones want to get us out of the Middle East. Uh, and of course they would like to destroy Israel, uh, the, uh, which is not exactly a limited objective. Uh, and uh, the IRA of course uh, wants Northern Ireland to be part of Ireland. But they, uh, these groups know uh, that the use of these weapons would be counterproductive uh, politically. It would, uh, for example, cost them a great deal of support in uh, uh, countries that have been supporting them before. Cult fanatics, well, look at what happened in the Tokyo uh, subway. That, I think, is a far more likely uh, scenario. Because here you have people who really want to produce an Armageddon, who want to destroy the world, who thinks that if they just provoke uh, a massive destruction, uh, then the world will be reborn. And uh, of course, uh, uh, well, we're lucky in the Tokyo subway. These guys were partly incompetent. What was unlucky about it is uh, uh, that the uh, Japanese police were also incompetent. I mean, there had been a previous attack. Uh, people had previously died, and, uh, and that was uh, uh, ignored. Uh, but these are the types, the fanatics who are so blinded by the righteousness of their cause uh, that they are uh, completely blind uh, to the consequences of their actions upon others. One can recall Hotspur's ringing exhortation in Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part One: Doomsday is near, die all, die merrily. Uh, not a common sentiment uh, among any of us, including, I may add, military men that I have known. 
And uh, you not only, of course, have uh, uh, the nuts in other countries, you have the nuts in this country uh, as, uh, as well, a long list uh, of them. Now, what prevents or discourages the use of weapons of mass destruction in war or as an instrument of terror? Well, there are three main answers to that question. Deterrence, the norms of the law of war, and arms control and uh, disarmament. Now, deterrence operates on two planes, offensive and uh, defensive. Offensive deterrence means that a nation has the means to inflict severe punishment on any nation which attacks it with weapons of mass destruction. It has come to mean, uh, it, the meaning has changed. At the beginning, it meant, uh, in the early years of the Cold War, it meant that you had to match your opponent weapon for weapon. Uh, if he had uh, chemical weapons, you had to have chemical weapons. If he had biological weapons, you had to have biological weapons. Uh, but we've gotten away uh, from that, essentially, to the concept that deterrence is based on overall strength. Uh, the United States can certainly, I think, deter its opponents, even if it does not possess, at least from war use, chemical or biological weapons. Def uh, defensive deterrence can be either active or passive. Active defense means, uh, actually, in this case, the use of, of uh, preemption. Uh, if you know that there is a center, uh, like the Bin Laden Center, uh, of course, uh, we would attack it even before it launches a stroke, although in this case, uh, that may not have been the case. Passive defense, of course, means that you have the means of protecting uh, yourself, such as gas masks, evacuation procedures, adequate civil defense uh, system, although I think evacuation procedures... Well, I looked uh, one time, my nephew is, um, was an Annapolis graduate, and when he was stationed in Norfolk, he took me down to the naval base and toured around, and uh, we drove around uh, uh, the, um, all the, the web of highways around Virginia Beach, Norfolk, etc., and I turned to, to John and I said, how the hell are you going to get your population out of here in case of a nuclear attack? Uh, and uh, of course you're not. Moreover, there's not the will for a civil defense system. I mean, we have to think that came out very clearly during the uh, course of the Cold War. Um, uh, let me uh, skip this part uh, of it. Um, uh, yeah, let, let me go on to the just war and the laws of war, and I'm going to summarize that uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I think that the, the, the revolution that has taken place, I, I've written fairly extensively on that, and I delivered a paper on Dartmouth that I intend to have uh, published on this, is uh, that the classic just war uh, theory used to be uh, that the major thing that counted was intention. In other words, if um, your intentions were right, your cause was righteous, uh, that was enough. And uh, uh, if, uh, for example, uh, you carry that out into the conduct of military operations, for example, in strategic, uh, in strategic bombing, and you were really headed, really going after military objectives, even if surrounded by uh, civilian uh, targets at the same time, you were still justified uh, in doing that. And that doctrine, which by the way is a very old one, it comes from classical times, it was refined by the theologians uh, of, uh, of the Middle Ages uh, to a very great extent. Uh, Augustine and Aquinas just talked about just war theory. Uh, that uh, I think uh, prevailed for a long time. It was uh, uh, secularized uh, in uh, American uh, uh, military political uh, thinking, uh, that uh, you know, the uh, in our military experience, for example, and I wrote this in, in my first book, uh, which was from my doctoral dissertation, uh, you've got to let the other guy strike the first blow. Uh, and once the other guy has uh, struck the first blow, then you have your justification for the use of force. Now, some of those were fairly unambiguous. I mean, Pearl Harbor was fairly unambiguous. Uh, uh, but then you get to questions of the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, for example, or the Mexican War, for example. Who fired the first shot? 
uh, in, the, in the Mexican War. You remember the young congressman named Lincoln challenged President Polk on that on the floor of Congress. Uh, really, uh, where was the first blow fired? Was it fired in Mexico uh, or in uh, U.S. Uh, uh, territory? Uh, so uh, that is essential. That this has become secularized uh, in our own uh, uh, time. And, uh, the laws of war, which were developed partly at the same time as the just war doctrine, uh, the basis of that is that there were certain things that were permissible to do in war and certain things that were not permissible to do uh, in war. And there are two types of uh, classification, I would say, on that. Uh, one is uh, actions that are permissible or, or non-permissible, are prohibited, and then weapons that are permissible and that are not permissible. Uh, so if we look at those, uh, first of all, actions that are, uh, let me do it this way, that are prohibited in warfare. Well, it's gradually come to be accepted that uh, it's crucial to spare the innocent while fighting one's enemies. Okay, I think everybody would agree that. You can spare, you, you don't target the innocent. But then if, if you look at all the international treaties, conventions, you will find that there's always an exception clause. You don't target for example, a city where there's a heavy civilian population unless it's being used for military purpose. Unless there are military facilities there, uh, unless uh, uh, there's military equipment there, unless it's heavily defended. This goes from siege warfare on, uh, I may add. Uh, but um, cultural sites, well, you don't target those. You don't want to blow up churches. Uh, monasteries, etc. But think of Monte Cassino. That, by the way, was a mistake. It wasn't being used uh, as a military facility, but we thought it was. We thought it was a perfect observation post for the Germans. So General Eisenhower gave the order, quite understandable in the circumstances. I mean, this thing was looming above. If you've been to Monte Cassino, the thing looms above the city where our soldiers were fighting. And they blew it up. And then the Germans moved in and occupied it. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, here is a prime cultural uh, target, uh, which, uh, in my opinion, was perfectly justifiable in targeting under the circumstances, even though only psychologically justifiable, maybe. What about weapons, the banning of weapons that are dishonorable? Well, Jeffrey Best, in his history uh, on uh, war and law, which is a fascinating book that I would recommend to you, uh, has summarized the record neatly on that. Crossbows, gunpowder, red hot shot, shot, and dumb, dumb bullets are well known cases in point. All except the last name entered into common usage as soon as technology and finance permitted. Another quote The whole truth about the history of weapons innovations is that almost all of them, whatever the nature and strength of the objections at first encountered, slip into common use as soon as the objectors can acquire them for themselves, whereupon the law adapts them accordingly. The classic case is artillery, uh, I may add. Uh, when it was first introduced, the knightly class, not totally disinterested, uh, I may add, uh, objected strongly. There's a, a quote, in, a marvelous quote in Cervantes' Don Quixote, you know, where he said, oh, the lousy things that artillery uh, has done, you know, to our profession. But one prohibition has worked surprisingly well, and that's the ban uh, against uh, poison. And I may add uh, uh, that uh, although there have been violations, the violations have been sporadic, and the taboo has generally uh, stuck, although at times it has been uh, seriously threatened. At, at times, I think it has been overwhelmed. It was overwhelmed in World War I, certainly, and uh, overwhelmed in the Iran. Uh, Iraq uh, uh, war. The other development
The other development that has uh, taken place, uh, two, uh, let, me, let me talk about two developments, uh, summarizing what I have in more, much more detail in my paper. One is, uh, of course, that you have moved uh, in history for, from a universalist position of uh, when the uh, church, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, really dominated the, the Western world. I'm only talking about the Western world. Uh, here and uh, t talked in terms of natural law, the law of nations, uh, etc., uh, so that ethical values were supposed to have a kind of a concrete supernatural force. Uh, to a very different world, beginning with the Renaissance, beginning with thinkers like Machiavelli and Hobbes, uh, of course, uh, where the concepts of the natural order have uh, uh, eroded. And uh, in the 19th century, of course, with the rise of nation states, have come to what I have come to call uh, the nationalization of ethics, in which the rules governing politics and war are determined by the prince or the state, and that replaced, of course, the previous universalization of values that underlay uh, the just war. Uh, concept. National leaders, I like to say, replaced theologians in determining what was permissible and uh, what was uh, prohibited. And that, of course, helps in the extent to which violence is used and violence is permissible. You have that development in the 19th century, then you have the counter development where you have moved from the earlier position. Uh, on the laws of war, the earlier development of the laws of war, where it's mainly international jurists and theorists like Grotius and Vattel uh, who draw them up, and now you're beginning to talk about conventions and uh, uh, treaties, etc. But I'm going to go over quickly uh, a lot of uh, this stuff, otherwise we will uh, never uh, uh, get, uh, get through. I want to move, actually, uh, to uh, the uh, latter uh, sections. Let me just say in con conclusion with this whole idea of the just war and the laws of war that I, I think what has happened with the development of weapons of mass destruction is that now the effects of weapons are more important than intention. Uh, in other words, we've come to the concept uh, that uh, there are certain weapons that should not be used because their effects are so frightful, no matter how righteous our cause uh, may be. And as I say, in the control of weapons, it is far easier, uh, let us say, to put a ban on specific weapons. That can work on certain, hasn't worked on a great many, but it can work on certain weapons, weapons that are associated with poison, uh, as both uh, chemical and uh, biological uh, weapons uh, are. But let me move on uh, to arms. Uh, uh, control. Arms control, disarmament, and the strengthening of the norm have now become extensions of national policy, a development which would have surprised Clausewitz, but which I think he would have recognized uh, if uh, he were living uh, today. And we have gone, for example, in the nuclear field, of course, to reducing the number of nuclear uh, weapons, to trying to get away from the concept of overkill. Uh, that dominated a good part of uh, uh, the um, uh, Cold War. I do not, by the way, foresee uh, that uh, the major powers will be able to scrap all nuclear po uh, weapons uh, in the uh, foreseeable future. Because but one of the paradoxical effects, of course, of doing away with biological and chemical weapons uh, that uh, now you still have nuclear weapons, uh, in other words, uh, uh, for deterrence purposes. And the, the problems, of course, uh, of uh, total disarmament of nuclear weapons, you can certainly reduce them considerably, uh, is that it, uh, it means it would have to be total. In other words, everybody would have to do it. And look at the Iraqi experience. I mean, they were far more advanced uh, than the IAEA uh, estimated. In fact, they, they didn't spot it at all. 
And nuclear weapons, uh, of course, would be far easier to spot than some of uh, uh, the others. And it's partly because, indeed, of uh, nuclear deterrence that um, uh, it has been possible to move and disarm from other weapons, uh, chemical and uh, biological weapons. Now, another form of arms control, besides making treaties, reducing forces, uh, etc., and you know we are, uh, they are working in Geneva, the ad hoc committee on having a um, strengthening the biological weapons convention by devising inspection provisions. The reading you got uh, uh, from uh, my friend Jonathan Tucker uh, brings you up to date on that, and I'm not going to dwell on that. I will just say that my personal view, uh, unlike my British colleague uh, Graham Pearson, is that th this will not totally solve the problem. It'll help, but it won't totally solve it by any manner uh, of means, given especially the intelligence problem. It's very, very difficult. Another form of uh, uh, arms control, of course, consists of export measures to prevent the proliferation of chemical and biological weapons. Jonathan talks about that, the Australia group, which was partly a result, of course, of the Gulf War, and discovering how many of us had been helping out, uh, our companies had been helping out the uh, uh, Iraqis. This is an informal group, but it has had uh, certainly some effect because it means that the members uh, at least coordinate uh, their operations and uh, the proliferators can't just go along with a shopping list and moving you know, from one power that denies them to another uh, that is willing uh, to, uh, uh, to feed them. Uh, the problem, of course, with that, Amy Smithson's uh, publication uh, very well deals uh, with that from the Stimson uh, uh, Center, uh, is uh, that uh, the developing countries don't like it. They don't like it at all because they say, uh, you know, uh, this hinders our development uh, if these products are kept out of our hands. And so there's a potential north-south conflict uh, there that uh, has developed. It almost derailed, I may add, the completion of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Well, let me go down to my conclusion, uh, whence the, the future. It is always treacherous for an historian to predict the future, and we're always... Uh, uh, told us when we were graduate students to be, uh, tread carefully there. It's a minefield, but I'm going to do so. Uh, and I'll list about five assumptions about wars in the 20th century. Uh, first of all, the world will still be dominated by nation states. Second, international anarchy, although modified, and hopefully modified significantly, will remain a problem. Thirdly, war will still be necessary as an instrument of policy, although increasingly we can hope it can be used for peacemaking operations. Fourthly, nuclear weapons will be reduced in quantity, but they will not be totally eliminated. And finally, terrorism will be the major national and international security problem. How are we regard, to regard the end of war in the 21st century? Harkening back to Clausewitz's two definitions, I warned you I would do that, we confront a fundamental philosophical question. Is the aim of war the maximum use of military power, or is it the harnessing of violence in the service of political purpose? If the latter, then the strengthening of the norms of war along with arms control and disarmament, has become a vital part of state policy, only a vital part of the policy of the United States. The second Clausewitz definition now embraces far more than he could have imagined at the start of the 19th century when the destructiveness of weapons was still limited. Bearing in mind the dangers posed by the dynamism of total war, what can be done to to prevent the use of weapons of mass destruction, either in combat or by terrorist acts. What wars are most likely to lead to the total breakdown of the established barriers and the use of weapons of mass destruction? I can distinguish at least four types of conflicts that lead to extremes, and which therefore should be avoided. Protracted wars, first of all, in which the frustration of a quick victory 
leads the combatants to escalate the level of violence. Survival wars, in which the existence of a state, a people, or a leader are at stake. Thirdly, guerrilla wars, in which there is no mutual recognition of respect uh, 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 for one's opponent. And finally, ideological wars, in which the combatants are so intoxicated with the righteousness of their cause and the iniquities of their foe that they do not hesitate, ultimately, uh, to uh, resort, uh, let me say, uh, to um, uh, weapons, hitherto forbidden uh, weapons. Well, uh, again, a lot of things we need to work on uh, in the future. Uh, we certainly need to worry about the accidental discharge of nuclear weapons, not so much in the United States. Of course, I think our system, our PAL system, as we call it, is fairly secure, but uh, the Russian system, which we actually gave to them at one point under the table, uh, has been deteriorating. It's not the only nation to whom we gave, uh, I may add, that system. Uh, so we still have to worry about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Senators Lu Nunn and Lugar have uh, suggested what I think is very valuable, separating warheads from launchers. Uh, in regard, uh, of course, to chemical and biological weapons, I was talking then about nuclear weapons, uh, further treaty conventions will do a great deal to help that, and they will strengthen the norm against the use of these weapons. But ultimate success in banning their use will depend upon sophisticated intelligence and a willingness to punish transgressors. The international community cannot afford a repetition, the tepid repetition of the response to the Iraqi use of chemical weapons against Iran, just because we did not like uh, Iran. I'll tell you a story in the discussion about that. The state's parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention must be ready to punish the transgressor by economic or, if necessary, by military means, and the use of these weapons should be criminalized under international law, the use of possession. Fighting terrorism, of course, will be more difficult because it depends on police action or on military force, or the military forces may be involved. And no nation is prepared to cope with the problem. A great deal of effort is being expended in the United States to prepare for the eventuality of terrorist attacks. I now have uh, a um, document uh, which I put together. Every time I find out about new organizations involved in it, I put down the name of that organization. I'm growing more and more horrified uh, as uh, uh, I see the number of organizations knowing what will happen, that they'll be tripping over one another if there is uh, an incident. Where does your jurisdiction begin and mine end? You're all familiar. Uh, with that. Uh, the solution, of course, is first of all detection and prevention. And that is where a great deal uh, of uh, uh, ad the attention uh, is, uh, is necessary. And particularly, I look upon the danger there if you look at the three types of uh, weapons of mass destruction as being uh, biological. I'll leave out the uh, and then I will conclude. Well, uh, things that can make a difference. Defense, training, preparedness can make a difference. Nothing will make much of a difference if the will is not there. Clausewitz would have agreed on that uh, very much so. And a caution is necessary, I think, at this point. There's no perfect defense. There never will be. Moreover, defense preparedness against any CBW attack is expensive, and it possesses political risks. Ultimately, its success would depend upon full cooperation with the civilian population. I find it hard to imagine the American population fully cooperating, let's say, in a massive uh, preparation. The Israelis can do that. Smaller countries can do that far more easily uh, than ours can. And unfortunately, 
if there is any cooperation, it's much more likely to emerge after an attack rather than before an attack. If we have a really Pearl Harbor kind of thing, then, then you know, the mentality will change. We are left with the question, do the American people have the will to take those measures, which would protect them in case of terrorist attack? Or would they go into denial and trust the luck? Finally, what about the psychological and political co uh, toll which preparedness would exact? Are we willing to turn ourselves into a garrison state? I mean, President Eisenhower warned against that, uh, indeed. What interference with civil liberties are acceptable when confronting what is still a hypothetical threat? What would Clausewitz advise if he were sitting on the National Security Council of a democratic state? Well, I leave these questions with you for further consideration, and we'll close now. <laughs> uh, actually, it all begins with the um, uh, Geneva Protocol uh, of 1925, which uh, was uh, put forward uh, by the United States and then not ratified by the U.S. Senate for 50 years. Now, that was essentially a non-first use uh, convention. Uh, in, the, in several ways. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it said that, of course, the use of chemical and, and biological weapons, and this is in our book, the Poles added that, uh, was abhorrent uh, to the conscience of mankind and therefore uh, should be banned. Uh, however, a lot of the major powers put in a reservation that uh, this only operated between those who signed the uh, convention and who ratified the convention and uh, it uh, would uh, certainly uh, be uh, uh, non-operative if anybody violated the uh, convention. And then it was, in, in a way, the same thing as a legal contract. You know, if one side violates anyways, uh, the contract is, uh, is null and void. It's true in international law as well as in uh, domestic law. Uh, so that was essentially a non-first use. It hadn't said nothing about production, uh, nothing about stockpiles, nothing about possession or transference of, of weapons. Uh, and in, uh, finally in 75, we did ratify uh, that, the last major power to do so. The uh, Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention of uh, 72 went much farther, of course, uh, at least uh, as far as to what its stated aims were. And that was not only to prohibit uh, the use, but also to prohibit the possession, the stockpiling, uh, and the transfer of biological and toxin weapons. Uh, its uh, weakness, of course, is uh, uh, that uh, it had no enforcement, no compliance provisions, and still does not to today. Uh, the attempt is, is being made in Geneva with the ad hoc group, and I would commend what Jonathan says in his piece on that in the new tower, uh, the efforts that they are making uh, to have a uh, compliance uh, regime put forth as, I may add, a separate protocol because amending the uh, BW uh, C convention is too difficult. You'd have to get unanimous consent from those who had signed it before. So it's politically really impossible. Uh, the um, Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, signed in 93, ratified in, by the United States in 97 at the 11th hour, I may add, and uh, some of us worked on that. Uh, that, uh, of course, uh, goes along in the first part with the same principle that you have in the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, and that is to ban not only use, but uh, possession, stockpiling, transfer to destroy all uh, the production facilities. Uh, the Russians have apparently 40,000 tons of this stuff. Uh, we have, uh, 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 although we're just beginning to destroy it fairly well, 30,000 uh, tons of uh, lethal uh, chemical agents, and uh, that has created, I may add, a great many of uh, uh, problems. You know, it's easier to build this stuff than to get rid of it, uh, unfortunately, and uh, 
uh, environmentalists have been uh, clamoring on that, and uh, local communities say anywhere but in my backyard. And then if you propose putting it on rails and transporting it, then you have another uh, outcry. And the Russians are beginning, you know, maybe that's a sign of hell. At least the Russians are beginning to protest in the same way. So they're developing some sort of conscience on this. Uh, the uh, treaties, uh, these, this treaty, this is, look at the size of this. Uh, that is the size of the uh, Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. The, this is published uh, under the GS, uh, uh by, I presume, the government printing office uh, of the uh, United States uh, Arms Control and Disarmament uh, Agency. Well, it doesn't, doesn't seem to say on the cover. Uh, but in any case, uh, the treaties have gotten longer and longer, and the new biological will probably be longer, which means that the problems that are going to uh, bedevil us at this point are implementation and uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, these, this treaty and the biological treaty, however, are unprecedented in the sense that unlike uh, the non-proliferation treaty, they're totally non-discriminatory. In other words, they do not uh, discriminate between possessors and non-possessors. One thing, the non-possessing nations, developing nations, are uh, angry at uh, is um, on the nuclear field is that, well, you know, this, uh, this is uh, you boys have the weapons uh, and you're committed to an indefinite, uh, as far as time goes, elimination of them, but you haven't done very much uh, for it as far as we can see and we can't have them. Uh, and, uh, uh, but these, these two other treaties uh, do not make that distinction and uh, these are treaties uh, that were negotiated uh, on a multinational front, uh, of course. Okay, that's probably all I should say, so I leave enough time. So, why don't you handle this, uh, Colonel, well, as far uh, as uh, recognizing right. people, you know them. And okay, mm -hmm. uh, just if you have questions, uh, go ahead. Uh, I think you had, uh, you can lead us off there, then feel free to jump in. Um, I'll sorry, try not to hedge. <laughs> <laughs> You already asked the best question at the end of the lecture. Um, it wouldn't be fair for me to ask you to answer your question. So. Uh, back at the beginning, <laughs> uh, and let, let me just say this on the questioning. As he, you're speaking uh, nice and loud and clear, be sure to do that so the mic can pick that up. Uh, back at the beginning of your, uh, your talk, you said that uh, you, you talked about the plus whiskey and concept of total war. So I was curious in your study. Absolute war, actually. Absolute war. Yeah. In your in your uh, study of history, has have there been instances where one of the belligerents has had a weapon which would give them the ability to wipe out the other side completely? Not until now. Failed to use it. Yeah. And and if so, if not, as you're saying, what does that imply about uh, this Bosnian concept of absolute war? given that we do have nuclear weapons today as you look at it in the future? Well, I think it, uh, it's hopeful. I mean, we have had, uh, we've had the, we have the weapons of absolute war. We have not used them. There have been uh, several close calls. The closest call of all, of course, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. But there was also a, a close call in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War, although that was not, I think, as, as dangerous as the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, it's. Uh, I think when you look at Clausewitz, it's it's a very dense book. I, I, as I threatened, I brought it with me, and uh, I uh, have it uh, underlined, noted, etc. I've actually read all of it, <laughs> which uh, not too many of my colleagues I may add uh, can uh, can claim. But you know, he talks about war in two terms, and absolute war to him. Uh, was a philosophical conception. I mean, this uh, this guy was, you know, a student of Kant, uh, and uh, uh, therefore he he talks first of all in philosophical terms, and that's where he sees it with no restraints. And you have to remember also that he was writing at a time when these weapons didn't exist, the weapons we have today. And then he goes on. And I think this is interesting. He talks about real war. And real war is war that's under the control of states. Uh, and recently, of course, uh, and I think you have to bear this in mind, and it's, again, uh, 
a fruitful uh, source uh, for this discussion. Von Krevold has come out with a very interesting, to me, absolutely frightening book called The Transformation of War. Uh, and uh, also, you, you know, uh, uh, John Keegan has a somewhat different view of, of warfare in his history of warfare than, than Clausewitz does. Uh, but essentially what von Krevold is saying is that what we're seeing now is really the potential dissolution of national states uh, with uh, secession movements, you know, the Basque movement, uh, the movement for independence in, in Corsica, uh, etc. We were very conscious of the, of the Basque uh, uh, separatist movement. We were in Spain last year, and uh, I may tell you a personal story that we were in a wonderful hotel in the Gran Via in Madrid, and right across was their, what is their premier department store, and uh, fortunately, after we, this was after my wife and I got home, we read, picked up the paper one day, and Basque separatists had, had uh, bombed uh, that uh, store, which was diagonally across where uh, our hotel was. So we said, well, we, at least we were in Spain at the right, uh, at the right time. Uh, but, uh, you know, von Krevold is, is saying essentially that, that Clausewitz's description of warfare as national policy is a 19th century concept. It's true to his age, and indeed what may happen is, is a fragment, we may go back to fragmentation. And if that's the case, then every prediction that I have made is wrong, and maybe I'm not predicting in that direction because I don't want to. Uh, I may add, uh, because then we would have an arms control problem, uh, which uh, would be even more dangerous than anything we face uh, we face today. But I think you have to, you know, bear that distinction. That is, at one time he's talking as a philosopher, and another time he's talking uh, as somebody who has observed uh, actual uh, war, the war of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which seemed uh, pretty extensive at that time, and which seems pretty limited to <laughs> in possibilities to what we have today. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I guess just think I'm not a historian, but I Please pursue it. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, think of the uh, Mongolians took over most of the world. Oh, yeah. Most of the known world at the time. Uh, probably didn't hold back anything in their attempts to no, they, the entire world. They didn't uh, hold so back anything that, uh, as long as they had it within their means. And they exterminated entire populations, yeah. Okay, go ahead. That's uh, they stopped outside of Rome. Yeah. Until the Hun stopped outside of Rome. Well, he's talking about the Mongolians. That's I think. Was a Mongolian. Well, yeah, I'll, well, I, I suppose. Your, I'll okay. <laughs> Well, I think what you're saying essentially is that you know that massacring civil populations is not something new. What is new is that, uh, uh, you know, there were limits to how many people you could kill if you just had uh, swords, javelins, etc. Now, potentially, there are no limits to how many people you can kill. What will be restraint? Yeah. Restraint. Nation states are apt to, you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not suicidally uh, inclined, nor are national leaders. Now, that doesn't mean that national leaders, let me get this uh, right, are not willing to send out people on kamikaze missions to blow, uh, you know, to blow others up. Uh, that they're quite willing to do, any of these organizations. Uh, certainly, Islamic Jihad is, is willing to do that whenever they want to do something inside Jerusalem or they want to comp or Hamas to complicate the peace process. Uh, in the Middle Age, in the um, Middle East, and they'll say, "Well, you know, think of, think of the bonus you get. You you immediately, with the Islamics, you immediately translate into heaven, and you have all the, you have all the women you, uh, you can want. <laughs> this is not the same uh, ethos uh, uh, on that. Pretty good inducement. In the Japanese kamikaze, of course, it used to be that you get promoted one rank." Uh, if you commit suicide, yeah. Which, <laughs> I don't think I think it's a pretty high price to pay for promotion. 
plan uh, one use of a nuclear, one use of a bio, one, one chemical attack on the United States, uh, where would you do it, why, uh, what, what do you think you know, the most vulnerable point is, that type of thing? I think yeah, it is a very good question. What would be the most vulnerable target? Is that what you're saying, essentially? I don't want to... Yes, yes. Well, when we're born vulnerable, you're going to have the most effect. Well, that, that, I, I don't want to frame the answer, but I'd rather have your thoughts on it. Okay, well, that is, that is really... in, in a. It will keep it on CNN. Any massive attack will keep it on CNN for quite a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, t <laughs> I would say taking out the soap operas would create a massive panic among housewives, <laughs> some of the more popular. Uh, I don't think that the target would matter so much, although obviously, you know, if you, if you could do something in Washington, D.C., uh, if you could do something in New York City, that, uh, uh, that would uh, certainly uh, have, uh, have an effect. Uh, but you, you know what happened? It, uh, terrorism, conventional terrorism, happened in Oklahoma City, where it's unexpected. I should think that a terrorist would think long and hard about a target that was big enough, but unprotected enough, uh, in order to uh, uh, produce its effect. If it's massive, it'll be on television for a long time. If the casualties are, are, are large, uh, CBC? CDC, or oh, oh, Center for Disease Control, yeah. Uh, that would be a, uh, a major target. New York, for example, uh, if we go back, for example, to the, the Twin Towers, I know that this was conventional dynamite, but uh, the models probably work for that, too. Uh, there is a book, by the way, that Jonathan Tucker, I can recommend, also edited on toxic terror. Uh, and uh, they talk about the case histories, and then they draw a profile of... Uh, your typical kind of terrorist. Uh, but when we talk about chance and accident in history, uh, in New York it was partly that this group, and this is the, the element of accident, partly that this group was in New Jersey. And every time they looked across the river, there were the Twin Towers. And it is that, besides the fact that it would create massive casualties, that determined them uh, to blow, to try to blow up the Twin Towers. And of course what they intended to do is to cause far more casualties than they did. They were hoping the two buildings, would, you know, one tower would collapse on the other and uh, you would have had uh, indeed uh, massive uh, uh, casualties. So certainly one objective will be to cause enough casualties so as to send a shock wave and possibly create a panic. The other thing is trying to think like the enemy. I mean, that's what we always uh, should do. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking, what if I wanted to do it? God forbid, but what if I did? Uh, is the other thing a target that's on, that uh, people will not expect to be targeted? And, and nobody expected uh, Oklahoma City to be a target of this, uh, this nut. How about like an indoor stadium where you've got oh, yeah. people? Uh, an indoor stadium would be uh, during a large uh, sporting event. During a large, uh, the sum of all fears. Have you read that book by Clancy? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good uh, that's a tempting target. Another one would be a national monument, for example, if you're going to target uh, target Washington. Uh, with the amount of concrete, of course, I suppose that. Uh, Thing that well, dynamite, not dynamite would work well, but a nuclear weapon would work even better. Or another possible target uh, uh, would be a uh, important state occasion, particularly one that involved leaders not only from the United States, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, what's going on in the UN? 
State of the Union Address, the Olympics, and indeed, you know, the people in Australia are already worried about, uh, and you, you remember what happened in Munich. Yeah. Refer to an anecdote about how the U.S. turned its head on uh, Iraq, or when Iraq used uh, chemical weapons. Oh yes, I was going to tell you that story, and I heard this, I won't name the person because it's, uh, I shouldn't. Uh, he told that uh, confidentially, but the story was that the first reaction when the news came in that uh, the Iraqis had indeed, it was confirmed uh, that they had used chemical weapons against the Iranians. A and I may add that one of the problems that you have in this is always that there are many more allegations than there are confirmed cases of use. So the first thing you have to do is find out where that happened. But it was confirmed. The United Nations uh, confirmed it, and it went up, as you know, from the use of mustard, uh, the use of non-lethal to mustard, and then to tabun, uh, and uh, from the use against combatants, human waves, right up to the use against civilians. Caused to get outraged, certainly. Well, they had a meeting in, uh, I think I can say, at least the State Department, to get it that close. And the first reaction was, oh my God, this is horrible, we have to do something about this. Then uh, somebody unnamed said, oh yeah, but look against whom they're using it. At, at that time, of course, uh, uh, the Iranians. Now, you know, that, that does pose the problem. Are you going to say that, uh, well, if they use it against one in one uh, nation, it's okay, but uh, not if they use it against another. And then, of course, you weaken, uh, you certainly weaken your, your ethical position uh, if, uh, if you do that. And so it got nowhere. You remember there was very strong resistance against taking very strong measures. The ultimate thing, however, that it did lead to is the export control uh, regime, the Australia Group, etc. So in the long run, there was some, uh, but uh, it was to put mildly tepid. And I don't think we can afford that kind of conduct because every time we don't react, of course, that weakens the norm. Uh, the norm can be overcome. I mean, it was certainly in, in World War I. What is interesting about the norm uh, against the use of, of poisonous weapons, essentially, uh, is that although it has been overcome, although it has been overwhelmed at times, and although we can say that in World War I, chemical weapons became assimilated uh, to the weapon systems of uh, the combatant nations, uh, after their use, and this is true not only of World War I, it's also true of the Iran-Iraq War, then you have movement in the other direction. You have recovery. Whereas nobody has ever recovered from, let's say, the use, the introduction of artillery. <laughs> Nobody's willing to do away with their artillery no matter what the initial, there hasn't been that same uh, determination to get back to getting rid uh, of, of those weapons. And what has sometimes been suggested um, is uh, that one of the reasons, of, of course, that I haven't met a soldier who really wants to fight in a, an NBC environment. Uh, I've met more politicians who are willing to have soldiers fight in that environment than, uh, than I haven't met any soldiers. Uh, uh, who are. There are a lot of heroes on Capitol Hill, uh, as, uh, as we know. Uh, but it's, it's a force complicator. It's not so much a force multiplier, it's a force complicator. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's a logistical force complicator. You, if you use uh, chemicals, that means uh, uh, you know, your supply lines are choked up with that, and weapons that you think are more useful uh, stay back. Uh, when uh, the whole question came up in, in World War II of um, whether they would be used in the invasion of Japan, and, and you began to get a movement, I may add, uh, more favorable in the, in the War Department and uh, in the military then, military high command towards uh, using chemical uh, weapons, particularly because the cost of operations had risen in the Central Pacific. If you look at the pattern, every operation costs more. And every operation was more of a horror, you know, Iwo Jima, the Okinawa, et cetera. And oh my God, we're going into Japan, and there's countless kamikazes uh, there. And so the issue was raised uh, within the War Department for the first time. 
Previously, it had been the chemical warfare service that got a little bit frustrated not having its prime weapon used. But they were always sat on, uh, you know, by the operations uh, division, particularly when there was still a war in Europe. And President Roosevelt had a visceral ant antipathy against chemical weapons. He had seen, apparently, on the tour, victims of gas. Those factors also operate, uh, say, which are emotional factors as well. Uh, well, uh, the uh, General Marshall uh, suggested that, uh, you know, this might be a good weapon uh, to use, uh, to treat, to handle uh, bypassed uh, posts which were still resisting, and also in the invasion, uh, possibly in the invasion of Japan. Uh, but then, of course, the question became academic uh, when we dropped uh, the, uh, uh, the nuclear weapons uh, uh, over uh, Japan. And another inhibiting factor, which I have not mentioned, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the chemical weapons are, obviously, they'd be effective in certain situations. Dealing with uh, cave defenses, I've written, I don't know if you saw that paper, uh, the, um, oh, what was it, the, um, uh, the English publication, <laughs> at this time blanked out, uh, on Operation Sphinx, which were the tests that the chemical weapons uh, people carried. I'll send you a copy of, of that. Journal of Strategic Studies, that's what it is. Uh, and uh, they conclude the chemical weapons uh, people, of course, concluded from that that it, they did carried out tests that these would be very effective against Japanese uh, fortifications, dug in caves, uh, uh, etc. And uh, you would hazard your men less than if uh, you use flamethrowers, which is the way, of course, that uh, we exterminated. Uh, great many of the Japanese that wouldn't surrender, and that was, unfortunately, most of them. Uh, so the, the, the debate had reached, for the first time in World War II, a higher circle of support than it, uh, with General Marshall behind it. Obviously, we should revisit uh, the question. But the war ended, and the question never came before President Truman, who may have had a different attitude, we don't know, than uh, President Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, did. Uh, but uh, that may have been the closest call we had towards uh, using uh, a chemical weapons. So we, uh, and if, if you look at the planning papers, and I did a good deal of this when I wrote my, uh, my thesis, if you look at the planning papers uh, for the termination of the war against Japan, you know, one image that comes clearly through, and I, being an academic, I'm constantly, uh, of course, arguing about uh, uh, with some of my colleagues who believe we shouldn't have used the bomb. And I say, look, you know, uh, that's very easy to say in retrospect. Uh, but uh, uh, there was no certainty at that time that the war was going to end. And you have the image in many of the planning papers of an endless, of a non-ending war. A war that would continue even after Japan was, was conquered. And uh, I said, you know, it's, it's a simple issue. There have been a lot of sophisticated and I think wrongly uh, uh, focused uh, papers and books. And well, the reason Truman really used it was to impress the Soviets. Well, I'm sure the thought occurred for uh, people in Washington that this would make an impression on the Soviets. They wouldn't be human if they didn't think of that. But to argue from that, uh, that the Soviets, uh, that it was used for that purpose, I think is wrong. Uh, America's military doctrine has always been to end wars as rapidly as possible by the maximum use of force. Truman had been a soldier in World War I. Uh, he had been in a command position. These were his boys. He was responsible for their lives. If he could save lives by using those weapons, uh, he would. And of course, that made academic any issue of uh, uh, using uh, chemical weapons. Uh, I, I got it. Yes, sir. Um, I uh, thought this is an appropriate question to ask you. I looked in your book and I saw that you wrote the section on intelligence in there. And I did hear you here a couple of times you made the uh, statement here concerned about I mean, intelligence is critical for this and, and in the reading in the book, 
you talked about how really appalling the state of intelligence was in World War II with Terrible. regards to chemical and biological. Well, sir, since reading about um, Am Shinrinko, and that being so recent, and the CIA has openly admitted that they missed it, and Am Shinrinko was active for eight years with the president's name on the top of their hit list, so, which was a public list. So um, I was wondering if, if you could give um, us your opinion on what seems to be impeding our intelligence process in your studies, have you got any idea why we would miss something like Am Shinrinko? Well, I think, uh, uh, let me begin with why the Japanese missed it. Because after all, they were right on the scene. And the major reason is that uh, when we occupied Japan, uh, of course, uh, they got a new constitution. Uh, and uh, one of the elements in that constitution was, of course, a respect for religious rights for different religions. Am Shurinko masked itself or defined itself as a religious organization. This made the Japanese police and Japanese authorities very reluctant uh, in dealing with it or in investigating it. So that they, uh, you know, ignored the signals. Uh, I think the, uh, that's, that's one answer right there. Uh, you may rem remember also that one of the big failures of intelligence recently is that we didn't predict India's nuclear tests. And <laughs> we, they, they, of course, knew perfectly well where observation satellites were flying over, and uh, so therefore they made their preparations for the nuclear test uh, covertly and uh, successfully. Uh, I think there is no such thing as, as perfect intelligence. You're always going to make mistakes. Part of it is uh, that, uh, and, and this is you know, even more crucial with biological weapons, uh, because biological weapons can be put together, be manufactured in a small laboratory. I mean, at least with chemical weapons, you need a factory. But you do not, at least if you're, go if you're going to produce enough chemical weapons uh, to have a, a, a battlefield impact or a strategic impact. You need a big facility. You don't for biological weapons. So that essentially, if you're going to improve intelligence, and th this, this is the key question, is you have to be intrusive. You have to be able not only to observe them uh, from the air, not only to observe them from space, uh, but also to get into the buildings themselves. And of course, that's what UNSCOM uh, did in Iraq. And I may add that the uh, chair of our colloquium this past year, unfortunately, he's going to Washington now. The man, he's the man who's writing the history of UNSCOM and who was an arms uh, inspector, Steve Black. And I expect his book is going to be, in fact, a very, a very good. Uh, and he brought up one arms inspector after another, so we got to know them all. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, they, they, they had theoretically the power to get into all buildings. They were supposed to have that power. The UN Resolution 687 said uh, that there were to be no restraints on them. But you saw how it operated. Uh, they were harassed. Uh, they were denied access. And this was in a situation, uh, this, this is a very serious problem because this is in a situation in which uh, the United Nations had far more power than they will ever have in any treaty. In fact, I raised that, I think, issue in one of my publications, the ESA uh, newsletter, uh, that, you know, we were authorized to do that. Uh, with the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention, you see the size of this thing, by the way. Every treaty has gotten longer. So that means that the implementation of any treaty is going to become more and more difficult. Uh, uh, and uh, even with that kind of power, we're still convinced, uh, I'm still convinced at least, and Steve is still convinced, that they're cheating. They, they certainly have kept some of them behind. They probably kept v VX. Can I have your attention, please? Softball games previously scheduled for this afternoon have been canceled. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
I see great disappointment. <laughs> but the only way you're really going to demilitarize any weapon, and this has become politically, and because of the existence of weapons of mass destruction, more difficult, uh, almost impossible to do, is by unconditional surrender. In other words, if we had driven to Mag Baghdad, then we could have really, uh, you know, disarmed the Iraqis. But you can imagine the problems that would have created. I mean, George Bush would have had to work very hard to keep the coalition together. We would have been occupying not a country that at least had some, uh, at least had roots in the Western tradition, but a country with very different traditions, very different cultures. And, you know, what would we have done once we occupied it? Uh, you know, you may argue, uh, I th uh, the only way I fault the way Bush conducted the war, I think he should have allowed the uh, army a little more time to break up the uh, Republican Guard, uh, that that might have been helpful. But he couldn't really have driven, uh, uh, driven to Baghdad. He didn't have the same freedom, really, that uh, Allied coalition leaders had in, in uh, World War II. You always have to consider, I think, the nature of the alliance, if there's an alliance. 